with moving away from linearity. And with linearity, I mean, so far as modeling tools, we discussed the use of generalized linear models, right? So we're going to question the linear term in, this, uh, in, the, in these models. And we're going to replace the L from linear with the A from additive and step from GLMs to generalized additive models which are like, uh, it's a GLM with additional flexibility. And I'm going to explain what this flexibility is and how we can use those uh, generalized additive modeling tools to build uh, pricing models. That's the idea for today. So you have the lecture sheets, which you should see now on, uh, on your screen, right? And it's very important to keep in mind that there is a very nice um, chapter from the book, An Introduction to uh, Statistical Learning. Yeah? So An Introduction to Statistical Learning, that is the uh, very popular book by Hasty Tipshirani and co-authors. And I'm going to discuss essentially chapter seven from that book um, today. And the chapter is entitled Moving Beyond Linearity. So like I said, we're going to step uh, beyond the GLMs and replace it with something more flexible. And that flexible tool will be called generalized additive modeling in statistics. And we're going to work a lot with the work of uh, Professor Simon Wood from Bristol on generalized additive uh, models and also with the R package that, that he put together to do generalized additive model fitting. Uh, and I also link to this, uh, to this book by Professor Wood. I also put a chapter from his book online. Um, so that's the, the reading material. Huh? So if you want to read more, if you want to know more, more technical stuff, more details about what I'm explaining today, you can find it here. Is that okay for everybody? We're good? Yeah? So nobody can type something or... Um... Yeah, okay. So I zoom, uh, I see here some things in the chat. Uh, okay, all is good. We're good. Okay, thanks. Right, so I see here some chat functionality. So whenever there is um, something that doesn't work properly, just let me know. Right. So here we are. Uh, we're going to talk about insurance uh, pricing for property and, and, and casualty. So the PNC is for property and casualty. And just as a, as a, as a motivation huh, for today's class, what we want to do when we put up an insurance tariff uh, plan is that we want to identify for each policyholder or for each insured I in our data set, in our, in our portfolio. We want to work with the number of claims reported during a certain period of exposure. And I introduce here the notation NI for the number of claims reported and DI for the period of exposure during which this number of claims got reported. So this is something we already introduced uh, two weeks ago, and that's still the target variable, one of the target variables that we have in mind for our class today. Next to the frequency component, you can also look at the severity component, right? And the severity um, is constructed by looking at, yeah, what is the aggregate loss reported by policyholder I over these NI claims that were reported? So LI, uh, it's the aggregate loss, so it's the sum of all the amounts that I paid as an insurance company to, the, to this particular policyholder I, uh, who reported NI claims. So that also means that if my client didn't report any claim, if the NI is zero, then the corresponding L, the corresponding aggregate loss will be zero as well. Yeah? So for those who were in the loss models course, this is something we discussed over there. Now, why do I need these two building blocks? Because uh, I'm going to put them together to really design um, a so-called risk premium or technical premium or pre pure premium. And this pure premium is going to consist of the expected frequency multiplied with the expected severity for my policyholder, right? So you can see this frequency component as sort of the number of claims per unit of exposure. Right, so I'm going to take there the exposure measure into account. And you can see this severity component as the average amount paid per claim reported 
right? So uh, the way to construct the severity is by looking at the aggregate loss for policyholder I, dividing it by the number of claims reported. So then you get somehow the average amount paid per claim reported. Of course, you can only use there those policyholders who did report at least one claim during their period of exposure, right? Because for the others, the aggregate loss would uh, be zero and that would correspond to a frequency being equal to zero. So that is already captured then in the frequency component. So there are two important things to learn here. Uh, you put together this, this technical uh, premium or this risk premium by multiplying expected frequency with expected severity for policyholder I. You want to take the characteristics of policyholder I into account when you're building models to estimate the expected frequency and to estimate the expected severity. And another uh, takeaway from this sheet is that for frequency, you're going to use all your data. So you're also going to use those policyholders who reported zero claims. Yeah? But for severity, you're only going to use that part of your data set that corresponds to the policyholders reporting at least one claim. Yeah? So you're not going to use their um, the policyholders who did not file a claim during the period of exposure. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, classify the risk. So we're going to build predictive models by taking the a priori uh, measurable characteristics of my policyholders into account. And we call that risk classification or segmentation. All right. Now, uh, the workshop that we started uh, last week is in fact reproducing or it's based on an article that I wrote together with uh, Roel Henkert, Maxim Kleisters and uh, Roel Verbele, and which appeared in the Scandinavian Actuarial Journal, where we explain now how can you design these insurance tariff classes in a data-driven uh, manner, both for the frequency as well of, as, as for the severity, right? And with this data-driven manner, what we actually refer to is like, for instance, when you have the postal code information about the policyholder, how can you group postal codes uh, with similar riskness? How can you do that in a data-driven way? Or when you look at the age of the policyholder, how you, can you put together like age bins, um, which group ages that represent similar riskness um, for the frequency or for the severity? So how can you do that in a data-driven manner? So data-driven means by avoiding ad hoc choices um, in, your, uh, in your model building uh, uh, steps. Okay, so here is what I uh, wish to do. I've got uh, my superhero here. His name is, um, let's, let's pick somebody uh, at random. His name is Jonathan. Huh? And Jonathan has a series of characteristics here, a series of features. So we know what his profession is. We know what kind of uh, car he drives, where he lives in Belgium, how many years he has his driver's license already, what kind of, what type of fuel the car is using. And we, we want to model the claim frequency and claim severity as a function of these different types of features. And what is important here is that I distinguish between the, um, the type of feature. Yeah? So here I see with the arrows in magenta, that these variables are so-called nominal variables. So that means if you look at um, professions, if you look at car types and car brands, if you look at type of fuel, you've got a lot of different levels there which are possible for this uh, variable, but there is no specific ordering in these um, levels or in these uh, values that the variable can take. So that's what we call in statistics a nominal variable. On the other hand, with the brown arrow, uh, we refer to numeric or ordinal information. Um, so that means that there is a specific ordering in the values that this uh, variable can take. Huh? Think about age, there is a specific ordering from young to old. Think about the uh, number of years that you have your driver's license. There is a specific ordering there from very new drivers to very senior and experienced drivers. And then the last type of information that I refer to here is the spatial information. So there is also a specific um, topology, if you want, in these uh, postal codes and in the spatial uh, information that we have about our 
policy. So the whole idea for today is how can I use these different pieces of information by using them in a clever way and by constructing them in a data-driven manner, uh, groups of ages, groups of postal codes, groups of car brands, of, prof of professions that represent similar characteristics. So these are my research questions. Huh? So if I uh, want to build GLMs for frequency and for severity, for frequency, I'm going to typically think about a Poisson distribution, for severity, about a gamma distribution. Then how should I select the risk factors and the features that come into my model? And for those risk factors that will be included in my model, how can I cluster or bin or fuse levels within a certain risk factor? So that refers to clustering uh, postal codes, clustering car models, creating age groups. How can I do that in a clever way? Yeah. So what we want to do is design a procedure that is data driven. So that is inspired by the data and that avoids ad hoc choices. And we preferably want to have something that is quite scalable to large um, data. The end product, and with this end product, I mean the, the tariff list, so the technical tariff that my model is construct is um, delivering. This end product should be interpretable. And I say here within the actual actuarial comfort zone, and with this last part, I mean that the end product that I'm gonna uh, construct today, even though it is relying or it is built by using more sophisticated toolings, model toolings, the end product is going to be a generalized linear model, but it's a generalized linear model uh, using factor variables where the specification of these factor variables is really inspired by uh, looking at more flexible um, modeling choices. Yeah, so I'm really going to try to come up with how do I construct these uh, age classes? How can I construct these clusters of postal codes and so on. How can I make all these choices in a, in a clever way? Yeah? So not the way how we did it with the toy example on GLMs earlier on, because there the, the definition of the age groups and the groups of professions and so on, all of that was um, predefined for us, was chosen ad hoc, was even created uh, artificially. So now we want to do that with real data and we want to do that in a, in a clever way. That's the goal for Okay, so let's take a moment to see whether you have any um, questions on that. So anybody who wants to share something? Um, any questions? Or anybody who wants to uh, raise hand or something? It's good in terms of the motivation something here no questions okay so Jill says no questions so that seems to make sense anything else just um, let me just pick at random somebody yeah Jonathan it has to be you of course So everything okay? Jonathan, can you say something? No. All okay? One, two, three. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Jonathan? Or Ismail? No, I, for me, it's okay. It's okay? Yeah. And you can raise a question if you want. You can interrupt me if uh, necessary. Mm, yeah, but now I'm okay. Okay, okay. Good. So I suggest we move on then. So once again, I will stress this uh, throughout the session. Do not hesitate to just type stop or just say, uh, I don't understand this or that or uh, whatever. Uh, 
right? Um, let's see. I'll just unmute. Okay, let's um, move on. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna introduce a building block that we need in order to um, in order to get around this uh, or to to fulfill our mission huh, to construct these tariff classes in a data driven uh, in a data driven way. Good. So here is the um, starting point. And um, these references, we already encountered them. And so these are some, some classics on, on GLMs. And today we want to go beyond, uh, beyond those. And we want to make the switch from uh, the GLMs to the generalized additive uh, models, right? So what are the essential differences that I, that I want to discuss? If you look at a specification of a generalized linear model, we're focusing on modeling a transformation of the mean with a linear predictor. Yeah? So this transformation of the mean, that is what we call uh, the link function. Uh, so our link function G applied to our mean U, that's what we wish to model with a linear predictor. And this linear predictor is of the typical uh, regression form. It's a vector of covariance X multiplied with a vector of regression parameters uh, beta. And that's an expression that is linear in the betas. So we say that that is a linear uh, predictor. But this linear predictor, it's not well suited for risk factors that relate to our response in a non-linear way. And there you should think about H of the policy holder, for instance, or you should think about the postal code effect. So it's not straightforward to capture the effect of such risk factors with the linear predictors in a, in a, in a GLM. Uh, you, want, you need more flexibility. You want to do that in a, uh, a non-linear way. So that's where the generalized additive models come into play because they allow for smooth effects of continuous risk factors, including a spatial smoother in the predictor. So today I will build up this transition from linear regression modeling to um, generalized additive uh, modeling. And then in the second half of this uh, webinar, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna explore a little bit in R how you can fit uh, such models, right? So that's important. Now we're gonna go from the linear predictor to a predictor including uh, smooth effects of certain risk factors. So let's see um, in the literature, historically, how people made this transition moving beyond linearity. So the goal is to relax the assumption of linearity while keeping the, as much as possible of the interpretability, right? And there are several ways to do that. You can uh, perhaps already come up with your own suggestion, suggestions on how to do that. You could do, for instance, polynomial regression. You could create um, step functions. Um, you could create um, step functions. And you could work with regression splines and um, smoothing splines, or you could work uh, with the generalized additive models that we're gonna build up today, yeah? So this, these three, three different bullets that you see over here, these really step from um, simple approaches to move away from reality to like a full-fledged um, full technique, the generalized additive modeling, where you can build in all the flexibility that, that you want to have. Right? This is also how historically throughout statistics, this moving away from, real, uh, from linearity has been built up. Huh? So we're going to take a short moment, or, uh, we're going to take a moment to briefly look into what is polynomial regression, what do I mean with these step functions, what is then a regression spline or a smoothing spline, and how does that all come together in the tool of generalized additive modeling. The idea is just to give you the, the main concepts of each of those techniques 
So my point here is not to spend really a lot of time on the technical details. Huh? Uh, I just want to give you the highlights of each of those methods. You can read more about them in the chapter, uh, in, the, in the background reading material that I introduced earlier on. And the whole point is that we actually want to uh, gain some practice huh, on working hands-on with these generalized additive modeling for insurance pricing purposes. That's the idea. So Jeffrey raised his hand, so I'll take a moment to, um, to see what um, his question is. Uh, so Jeffrey uh, asks what is most used between uh, GLMs and GAMs in the industry? So I think that's a very um, good question, Jeffrey. So my experience would say that the end product, so the, the, the products that actuaries, particularly pricing actuaries, want to deliver, that's still, uh, that it, these are GLMs. Uh, people want to build uh, generalized linear models because they're very easy to explain to stakeholders, to management, to clients, and so on. They're very easy to explain, and they're also very easy to deploy in an uh, IT system. So the final product that we want to build, uh, uh, the popularity of these um, uh, this products, that's definitely the GLMs are the most popular tool there uh, to produce. Then what about these GAMs? Well, we will use, or the GAMs are used, and that's also the, the, the technique that I want to uh, explain today. The GAMs can be used to design these generalized linear models in a very clever way, right? So what we then, or the way how you should see it then, is that we want to build like a flexible kind of standard, which is being built with this generalized additive model. And now we're going to build a linear model, a GLM, that is approximating this gold standard, if you want, in a clever way, right? So that your end product is still a GLM, but the way how you build up this model is inspired by more flexible tools. And today, these more flexible tools are the additive modeling tools from the GAMS. But um, in our next classes, we can use machine learning tools for that, for instance, yeah? and build such a uh, well-predicting flexible standard and then try to approximate this standard with... Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna go through the main steps of these different techniques to go beyond linearity. And we're gonna start with what historically has been uh, done as the first idea to move beyond linearity. And that is the idea of polynomial regression. So you see here uh, at the um, top of the sheet, at the um, right side top, you see an example that I copied from this uh, book, An Introduction to Statistical Learning, where we'll try to uh, model wages as a function of age, right? And what we see is in this particular data set, there is a nonlinear relationship between the predictor, in case of the age of uh, an individual, and the response, which is here the wage of this uh, individual, right? Now, if you say there is a nonlinear relationship, well, instead of using just your predictor in the uh, linear predictor, what people have been doing when they constructed a polynomial regression model is that they would use not just x, but also x squared, the uh, third power of x up to x to the power d mm, into this uh, model that they uh, are constructing, right? And usually you would do this with d smaller than 4, because larger values of d uh, would create polynomial curves that are a bit too flexible or too, uh, too exotic, let's say, with very strange shapes. So this is a strategy that you could, uh, that you could take huh? in case you see that the effect of a certain predictor on the response is not linear. Then you could say, OK, let's add powers of this, um, of this predictor in my regression model and let's create a polynomial regression. Now there the problems of course are, yeah, which powers are you gonna put into that, uh, into that linear predictor? Uh, how can you define uh, what is a suitable shape? Um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Alternatively, uh, what we could do is we could split the continuous X into 
so-called step functions, so into certain bins, and then we can fit constants in each of those bins. So that's what you see illustrated on the sheet. So again, you have wage as the response, you've got age as the predictor. And now we're gonna create certain bins of ages, and we're gonna fit a beta, so a constant or a coefficient, for each of the bins created, right? So we make a stepwise function out of this uh, originally continuous uh, x variable, and we're going to use um, we're going to use these step functions into our predictor. Okay. So the question here, of course, is how should I define my cut point? So where do I? How should I split my continuous um, covariate? Um, how should I do that? And also, if you think beyond the um, the continuous risk vector that I have over here. So if you think, of, for instance, about the postal codes, then how should you do that in multiple dimensions? Huh? So with a postal code, you think about latitude, longitude. So there you would need some kind of similar idea for uh, more than one dimension. Yeah, But this is also one of the tools that people historically have been uh, using in order to capture uh, nonlinear effects. So we have the polynomial regression, we have the step functions, and now we're going to switch to something that is related to piecewise polynomials and to splines. Yeah? And we'll see that these are building blocks that we need then later on in order to um, construct the generalized additive models. Okay, so what do I mean with a piecewise polynomial? Well, as the picture here at the top of the sheet already introduces or illustrates, you can do a cubic regression model, so a cubic polynomial, but you can do it piecewise. So you're going to create a cubic polynomial, in this case, on the age interval from 20 to 50. And then you're going to fit another cubic polynomial on the interval from 50 till the maximum age observed. Yeah? So that's what people refer to uh, or have in mind when they talk about piecewise polynomials. So instead of fitting the high degree polynomial over the complete range of our covariate, we're going to use low degree polynomials. So in this case, for instance, cubic polynomials. So that is x, x squared, and x to the power 3 over different regions, over different intervals of our continuous um, uh, predictor uh, x. Right. So here is the example if you would code, or if you write this down in uh, some mathematical notation. So what happens if I would do a piecewise cubic with a single knot that I put at position C or at value C, right? So in that case, for the x's which are below C, I would fit the polynomial here using coefficients uh, beta 0, 1, beta 1, 1, up to beta 3, 1, right? So I have to fit four parameters there. And then for x values uh, beyond c, I will have to fit another polynomial with coefficients beta 0, 2, beta 1, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So you'll see that if I do k different knots over the range of x, then we're going to end up with fitting k plus 1 different cubic polynomials. Now you can see that clearly here. In my example, I have one uh, split point. So k is equal to 1. I have one knot or one split point. So I have to fit two different cubic polynomials. So this introduces flexibility. Now you will be able to capture some uh, wild nonlinear uh, behaviors if you want. But of course, there are some problems that come with it. Um, you see quite strange behavior at the knots at the split points because there is no continuity there or whatsoever and you also have to position the knots yourself you have to decide yourself what the degree of your polynomial will be and so on and so forth yeah so these are drawbacks of this technique which will eventually be solved by the generalized additive modeling because there the technique will tell for us okay this is the optimal way to do that um, to to bring that flexibility into your model Okay, so let me just continue and uh, then we'll take some time for questions uh, later on. So the piecewise polynomials, which we sketched on the previous uh, sheet over here, they are discontinuous. 
Uh, so they typically have jumps at the split points. They will probably look a little bit strange, even ridiculous, right? So the way how people have looked into that is by adding constraints. So by adding or by limiting the behavior of, this, uh, of these piecewise uh, polynomials. For instance, you could impose that the fitted curve has to be continuous. You could also impose that, for instance, if you're working with a cubic polynomial, that the first and the second order derivative should be continuous as well. And that will create so-called smoothness, that will create a, a nice smooth curve uh, because then also the uh, first order derivative and the second order derivative must be continuous so it cannot jump around um, uh, wildly, let's say. And that's what we call a spline. So a degree d spline is a piecewise degree d polynomial, but with continuity in the derivatives up to degree d minus 1 at each knot. So if d equals 3, you'll be looking at a degree 3 spline or a cubic spline. So that is a piecewise cubic polynomial, but one that, not, that cannot jump around in a, in a wiggly way or in a very wild and exotic way, but it has to be continuous in derivatives up to degree 2 at each knot. So if I sketch that, and again I'm using pictures here, uh, from the chapter 7 in the book, An Introduction to Statistical Learning. If we look at the different possibilities that we introduced so far, we started with a piecewise cubic uh, polynomial. So there we said, okay, in this example, I've got one knot, but uh, there is no constraint of continuity or continuity of my derivatives. So these piecewise cubic um, polynomials, huh? they, their behavior, if I put it together, that looks a bit strange, looks a bit ridiculous. What I can do then here, and then I'm looking at the top row and then the picture on the right, I've got this continuous piecewise uh, cubic. So now I have a piecewise cubic. So I have a, a piecewise, uh, so I have a cubic polynomial in each bin, but I force it to be continuous at the split points. Right? So you already see that that reduces um, the, the amount of, of, of ridiculous behavior, let's say. So it means uh, I, can, I can create a, um, a, a, fitable, a fitted um, model here that seems to make more sense. But if I further want to improve the smoothness of my fit, then I will switch to a so-called cubic spline. So now I have not only continuity at the split point, but I will also have the continuity of the first order derivative and the second order derivative. And that results in quite a smooth fit uh, for the uh, scatter plot for the um, relation between wage and age that we are uh, looking at right here. If you say, I don't want to work with degree three splines, but I want to look at degree one splines, so at the linear splines, then you will have a, um, a, a a polynomial of degree one in each bin. And the only thing you're imposing here is that the function will be continuous at the split point. Okay, so that's what splines are doing. Uh, that's the idea of splines. Uh, so we have to define which order we're going to use. Uh, we have to define where we put the split points. And then the spline will create um, a fit uh, that is uh, quite smooth and huh, depending on the degree of the spline that you are using, okay? So that's essential. Um, the only thing we want to do now is to make this whole thing more automatic. Yeah? So how can we choose these split points? How can we choose the, the order of the splines? Uh, can we get some guidance uh, on that? Huh? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to switch more to a kind of um, a regression kind of thinking by explaining or by representing our splines with so-called basis functions. Uh, and that allows us, or that way of thinking will allow us to make the step towards uh, the generalized additive models where the procedure is going to do the construction of these flexible, um, flexible uh, fits for us in an automatic way. So the idea of basis functions is, is important. So for instance, if you're looking at a cubic spline with k knots, 
then you will be able to explain or to yeah to, to fit and to explain this uh, spline to express this spline using an appropriate uh, set of basis functions for instance you can use the following specification of uh, the basis functions we call that the truncated power basis functions where you're gonna uh, where you're gonna pit, uh, pick certain uh, knots here denoted with, with xi and you're gonna fit uh, functions like this. And so I know this is pretty uh, obscure, but the idea is that we're gonna put our spline together by expressing it via a series of, of basis functions. And I make that more specific or more clear on the, on the next sheet. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we want to fit a cubic spline to a data set by using k knots and by minimizing a sort of least square squared gradient. So by minimizing the sum of the square difference between my response y and the model that my spline is building, that's the f of x. So I'm using one covariate x here. I want to build a model f of x and I want to uh, estimate this model by minimizing the square difference between my response and what my model proposes. And if I work through a basis function representation of my spline, then I'm going to do this by expressing the f using the following components in my predictor. So I have an intercept, that's a beta 0. I have a beta 1 that comes with x. I have a beta 2 that comes with x squared, a beta 3 that comes with x to the power 3. And then I've got a beta that comes with each of those basis functions. Yeah? So that is a way how you can uh, express how you can um, represent your cubic spline. So what you need here then is of course the position of these knots again. Here denoted with psi 1 up to psi k and you need to pick the order of the or the degree of the spline and that's in this case it's a cubic uh, spline. You also see that you need um, k plus 4 parameters yeah, uh, regression parameters in order to capture, in order to express this spline. So a cubic spline with k knots will use k plus 4 degrees of freedom because there are k plus 4 parameters that can freely be estimated. And how will I estimate them? By minimizing the sum of square differences between my response and what my model is expressing. Yeah? So that is the so-called spline basis representation. That's a way how you can rather easily uh, uh, get those um, splines uh, because the previous condition where you said, okay, you can work with polynomial regressions, um, sorry, yeah, with, with, with polynomials defined on different intervals. And if you do a cubic spline, then at the split points, you should have continuity, but you also should have continuity of the first and the second order derivative. Yeah, that's very difficult to implement, right? So that's where these basis functions and the value of these basis functions come into place. Because if I tell you, you can work with minimizing this uh, least squares um, criterion, hmm? and you can express the model f using these basis functions uh, like this, then that is a way easier problem to solve, right? It's a way easier uh, way to achieve, to get, to get your spline. okay? There is one extra point that I should uh, mention here. So if you look at the picture, we again have wage versus h, and we show here in blue the cubic spline, which was fit by working with these uh, basis functions. And you also see an alternative spline that is called the natural cubic spline. So what is a natural cubic spline? That is a cubic regression spline with some additional boundaries uh, constraints. And the boundary constraints here is that you're going to use a linear instead of a cubic behavior for x smaller than um, the, first, um, the first knot, so the, the xi1 and for x beyond the xi1. So that is just to avoid very wild behavior at the boundaries of your, um, of your uh, spline or the boundaries of the, the model that is uh, fitted. Okay.
Um, so let me just go on um, a little bit and then take time for, for, for questions. So what I um, want to discuss here on this sheet is then of course how to pick the knots and how to pick the number of knots that you're gonna use. Uh, so if we look back at our basis function representation, we would use a certain number of knots denoted with k and we would position the knots at certain points. So how can you do that? Well, one way to do that is to put the nodes or to position the, uh, the knots in a uniform way, for instance, at certain quantiles of, of your data. And you could use cross-validation methods to choose the number of the knots. So that would mean that for different number of knots, k, you would calculate um, a so-called cross-validated mean squared error or some other function, some other loss function, and you would pick the value of k that give the, low, the lowest or the smallest um, mean squared error. So I know that we didn't discuss yet what cross-validation uh, means. We're gonna discuss that uh, later on in the, in the course. So at this point, the only takeaway that I wanna give you is if you look at the graphs here, we essentially fitted the, um, the natural spline and the cubic spline hmm, uh, for different numbers of k, yeah, or for different uh, degrees of freedom, for different numbers of k. And so how can we pick the uh, suitable um, number of knots that you need, the suitable number of degrees of freedom that you need? Well, you're just gonna look, where does my curve become minimal? Uh, where does my curve become small? And from which point on do I not see any major improvement anymore? So that is the way, or that is some one way how you can put up this um, selection process for the number of knots. Again, all of this is very manual. Huh? So we want to come to a procedure that will do all of that, uh, all of this for us, huh? that will make clever choices so that we can uh, quite easily construct these um, flexible functions. Of our, of our predictors, yeah? So this is a short note on how to choose the number of knots, the position of the knots. Don't panic yet if you do not understand what cross-validation is doing. I will carefully explain that later on, so uh, don't spend too much time on it uh, right now, yeah? So what do, or what is in a nutshell, a good point about splines? They introduce flexibility by increasing the number of knots while keeping the degree fixed. Uh, so you will stick to the degree of your spline, that's a cubic spline, for instance, and you can in introduce extra flexibility by including, an, uh, by including additional knots. So if you have a certain area where your function is very exotic or very wiggly, then you could put extra knots there to increase the flexibility of your spline to catch um, that particular behavior there. Okay. Um, so maybe let's take a moment now to uh, answer some questions. So if some people want to raise hands or want to ask something, give me a sign. Or if you say I can't follow or if you want to give some feedback. Uh, so let's take a minute to look into that. If you say everything is okay, I can understand it more or less than... <laughs> It would be great if you can uh, give me some feedback as well so that I at least have the idea that uh, there is somebody at the other side of uh, the screen. So Ahmed has a question. So I, I'm still finding the best way to do this. So Ahmed, I will try to... Um, allow you to speak. Yes, Ahmed? Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, could you please explain the, the basis functions again? Okay, good point. So I will uh, scroll back. Um, so in fact, so the use of basis functions, huh? it's a clever way to um, it's a more easy way to construct the splines. And the specific expression that you're going to use for the basis functions, that doesn't matter too much at this point. So in the uh, R tutorial uh, later on today, we're going to uh, experiment a little bit with different basis functions. So there you have a bit of a choice as a model builder. 
uh, to work with different types of basis functions. And if you think, for instance, like the basis functions you're going to use to model a flexible effect of postal codes, of long and left, that's going to be different from the basis functions that you're going to use to capture a flexible effect of age of the policyholder, for instance. Uh, we're going to come back to that um, later on today. So for now, I just want you to keep in mind working with these basis functions. It's more easy than specifying um, that you need to that you want to fit a model that is a uh, piecewise polynomial of which the first and the second order derivative have to be continuous as well. That's very difficult. But on the other hand, if you can say, I pick here some basis functions, I don't care too much which type of basis functions, but I could pick some basis functions, then fitting a model like this is um, a way simpler um, way to go. Does that help a bit, Ahmed? Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, so specific choice of those basis functions uh, will come back later will depend a little bit on the purpose you have in mind. Huh? Do you want to capture a spatial effect? Do you want to capture, capture an interaction? Do you want to do something else? So that will be uh, depending on what you see. Where we're really going to go from um, splines and their representation via basis functions, because that's what we, um, that's, that's the point where we arrived so far. We say, okay, this, working with these splines, that's a nice way to capture um, to bring in flexibility and to build flexible functions. And then if you want to calibrate, if you want to build such a spline, then it's a good idea to work with those basis functions because then you are essentially building like a regression model or a linear regression model, estimating betas that come with your predictors and with your basis functions. So that's a clever way to do it, right? What we now want to do is construct so-called smoothing splines. So instead of minimizing the squared error, the squared differences between our response and our, and our, and our uh, fitted model, we're going to add a penalty to our likelihood. And that penalty is going to drive like how flexible the function can be, right? So it's a clever way. Uh, what we're going to do is, a, is, is kind of a clever way to, to, to design a loss function, a penalized loss function, that will, that will govern automatically uh, the smoothness of our, um, of our, of our uh, model that, that we're fitting, right? So what we want to do is we want to build a model, a function of a predictor X, say, that fits the data well. So what I write here down is, a, is the criterion that I want to minimize. And I use a very general notation here, L. L is typically used for the loss function in, um, in data science. So I want to model the loss uh, that is constructed uh, if I have the observed target variables, the y's, and if I use as my model fit the g of x. Yeah? And typically, we write that loss function as a contribution of the loss function uh, evaluated in each available observation i. And we put all these contributions together, and that gives me the uh, overall loss. Now, the loss that I used so far was the square difference between the target y and, 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 the fitted, um, and the fitted value, right? You can also put in there the, the likelihood of a poisson or something else, right? So without any constraints on the j of x, we could pick a function that would overfit our data and would be too flexible. Uh, if I use a lot of uh, basis functions and I just tell the procedure, okay, I built this um, spline model for me, then I will get a, a model that is completely overfitting because I've put in there too many basis functions and there is no penalty for complexity being included. So I want to avoid that. I want to build a procedure that would, um, that would not allow, that would, would, would fight against such, such overfitting behavior. Yeah? So what we want to do is we want to fit a, a, a function g that fits our data well, that's also sufficiently smooth, no matter uh, how many uh, basis functions or how many knots that I put together to calibrate this model. And this is an important um, way of thinking, because what you see here is a penalized uh, loss function. And this idea will also be underlying 
uh, what our uh, generalized additive model will do, right? So a natural approach to avoid the overfitting is that instead of minimizing just the loss function, uh, think about a likelihood or a least, um, sorry, a negative likelihood or a least squares function that you wanna, um, uh, sorry, sum of squared differences that you wanna minimize. So think about something that you wanna minimize here that's given in blue, but you're gonna add a penalty to it and this penalty is going to consist of two components. There is on the one hand this lambda, we call that the tuning parameter, and there is on the, on the other hand the integral of the squared second order derivative. Uh, so that's a very complicated expression, but this guy in red will capture the wiggliness of our, uh, of our uh, function g that we construct. So the higher that is, the more wiggly, the more wild our function will be. Whereas if you think about, for instance, a linear, uh, a linear regression model of just a line, then the second order derivative will be zero. So then you have something for which this term in red is just zero. It's very small, right? So the more wiggly the function is, the more exotic the function is, the bigger this uh, integral of the squared second order derivative will be. And what is the lambda? The lambda is going to control how severe the impact of this penalty is going to be. So the lambda is going to trade, the, is going to tune the trade-off between goodness of fit, getting the blue thing uh, good, and the uh, wiggliness of the function that you construct. So here you see, uh, you've got our loss function, which encourages the G to fit the data well. That could be a residual sum of squares, that could be uh, minus a log, uh, a log likelihood, that could be whatever you want to use. We've got a penalty term in red that penalizes the variability or the roughness in G, so the wiggliness, right? And if the lambda is zero, there is no penalty added. So then the G will only focus on getting the fit as good as possible. So you'll probably end up with a G that is very, uh, very wiggly, uh, that is very flexible, that is overfitting your data. But on the other hand, the larger you build this lambda, the more important this penalty becomes. And if you really let the lambda become very large, then you end up with capturing a model for which the term in red is zero or almost zero. So then you're gonna end up with fitting just a, um, a linear regression, just fitting a straight line through this um, scatter plot of y versus x that you are considering. Yeah? So this is an important uh, kind of thinking. We call this constructing a smoothing spline. Yeah? So we're gonna say that if you minimize this procedure, this, this criterion, sorry, then you will, you will end up with a sort of optimal spline that is constructed. Now, of course, what you have to keep in mind here is that you have to make a choice for this lambda. Uh, so you have to tune the lambda parameter. You have to make a choice for the lambda in a specific, uh, in a specific way. So here is what we're going to do. So let's say we look at the residual sum of squares. So our loss function is specified as the square difference between y and g of x then the function g that minimizes our penalized criterion turns out to be a natural cubic spline with knots positioned at the unique values of x1 up to xn with continuous first and second order derivatives at each of the knots. Yeah? So this is a way to construct a so-called smoothing spline to, to, to define an optimization problem that makes sense and for which the result turns out to be, and you can analytically show that turns out to be this natural cubic spline with specific uh, knots and with a specific um, specification. Yeah? And you also see that over here, if I fit this um, natural cubic spline, uh, uh, and you see a few ways here to choose the value of lambda, let's not go into detail about that, but you see that a natural, that a nice uh, flexible uh, fit has been constructed. Okay. So once again, our tuning parameter lambda controls the roughness, the wiggliness of the smoothing spline and 
controls the effective degree. Uh, and that is now how can we use this kind of ideas to come to our generalized additive models. Yeah. So with the generalized additive models, of course, our goal is that we can flexibly, flexibly predict the y as a function of a bunch of predictors or covariates. Um, and with generalized additive models, uh, therefore, we do not want to focus on just a single predictor. And that is, or, or that was crucial or, or uh, a main characteristic of the techniques that we discussed so far. Uh, you can use these techniques like a, a smoothing spline or a, uh, a piecewise polynomial, etc. But we always discussed the use of those techniques with only a single predictor. Huh? So what is nice about these generalized additive models is that they give us a framework to do this, this way of thinking or this way of model building, but in the presence of um, multiple uh, covariates or predictors that we want to uh, include. Yeah. So the GAMS allow us to introduce nonlinear functions while maintaining additivity. So that means that in our predictor, we're still gonna add all these components together. So the Keteris, Keteris paribus interpretation of classical regression will still hold. And we're gonna capture the effect of one covariate given that the other covariates are fixed at a specific uh, value or a specific level. So the methods we discussed so far can now be used as building blocks for fitting this complete additive. Uh, model. And you see a picture here at the, at the top of the sheet where you have a flexible effect of year. So year is a covariate. You've got a flexible effect of age. So age is a covariate. And you've got an effect of education. But education is not a continuous covariate here. It's just a factor uh, covariate. So here you will just use or you will just fit a beta for each of the levels of education which are available um, in the data set. Yeah. So that's also good about these gums. You can combine flexible effects with just typical um, linear specifications of factor variables uh, and so on and so forth. So that's what we are going to do. And the gums that I will construct in the uh, workshop later today, well, they will rely on predictors, which I can specify in general terms like this. So I've got uh, a link function g which transforms my mean of the response and which then writes this uh, predictor as an intercept and then I've got dummy variables and their corresponding coefficients being estimated for my factor information. Uh, think about gender, think about uh, the level of education, think about the type of cover, the type of fuel. So I'm going to express those with just linear, um, uh, linear terms here, uh, as I've been doing with, with traditional GLMs. But then I can also include as many flexible functions as I want, uh, denoted here with fj, of continuous covariance. So here I could typically do like a smooth function or flexible function of h of the policyholder, of h of the car, of uh, power of the car, level of the BM scale, and that's the, the smoothers that we're going to construct uh, later on. And then here in the last part, you see something specific because now I'm specifying a flexible a food, uh, smooth function f of two pieces of information. So here I put together a smoother in multiple dimensions. And that's going to be particularly interested, interesting if I think about a way to handle the uh, spatial heterogeneity, so the effect of postal code in a regression model. Because postal code for each policyholder, I can look at the let and the long coordinates of the center of the postal code, and I can fit a uh, bivariate smoother of this let and this longitude of the center of my uh, postal code. So that's one way how I can uh, use this geographical information via smoothing. A different way um, why I could possibly use these bivariate smoothers is what if I have, for instance, age of the policyholder, power of the car, and I also want to include their interaction. 
then I have two continuous features, right? I already included smoothers for the um, univariate effect of each of the policyholder and power. And then I could use the bivariate smoother to include the interaction effect. So these are the different ways how we're going to play with these, um, with these smoothers uh, throughout the class today, right? So we have a couple of building components. We have dummy coded factor variables. So they are stored here. So that's with the uh, subscript, superscript D, sorry, for dummy coding. We've got smooth functions of the one dimensional continuous covariance. So that's denoted here with the C for continuous. And I have smooth functions of two dimensional continuous. And the S in my notation here refers to spatial. But keep in mind that you can also use this for, for interaction. Okay, any questions on that? Because this is important. This is like the general specification of a gun. This is what I want to put into it. And now I'm going to uh, detail to a certain extent, yeah, how can you calibrate these, um, these, these parameters, beta, these uh, smooth functions, f, etc. But these are the, the model specification is, in, is important at this point. Any questions? Cedric, just a moment. Um, so Cedric has a question. Okay, Cedric, you should be able to talk now. Yeah, you... Hello, Cedric. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I was wondering at the end, the uh, smooth function. So. It's used for, uh, for example, the spatial covariate, um, but it's not used to have smoothness between, um, for example, uh, two of the previous continuous vari variables. Well, it can be. So that's what I was saying about this interaction effect. Oh, that's the interaction effect. Oh. Yeah, so that will become clear um, in the demonstrations uh, with R later today. But it's a good point what you're saying. So you could indeed include a smoother, a bivariate smoother of age of the policyholder and power of the car, mm -hmm. right? So you can also say, let's capture this two-dimensional effect of age, on the age and, and, and power. That's also possible. Yeah, and we're going to see how to do that uh, later on. Yeah. All right, thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? No? Still okay? So we're almost there. So allow me to, um, I'm running a little bit uh, late, but allow me to finish these slides and then take a break. So what we want to do is uh, we want to estimate these uh, smoothers, F. We're going to do that with certain basis functions. We're going to do that by adding um, penalties to our likelihood. So this is the recipe that you will uh, recognize in R as well. Uh, when you're asked to fit such uh, gums with R, you're going to express the smoother uh, by using regression parameters, here denoted with beta Jn, and by using certain basis functions. And I leave the basis functions here unspecified. Because in R, you will have different choices that you can take for these basis functions. They will all result in slightly different smoothers, but it's more the general idea that matters here, right? And in order to avoid getting very wiggly and exotic smoothers, in order to avoid overfitting, we're going to add this wiggliness penalty to our likelihood. And that wiggliness penalty, it's again the integral of the squared uh, second order derivative and it turns out analytically that you can write this penalty as a function of your um, original regression parameters beta j and some matrix sj that has a uh, specific uh, specification. If you would see how this works for the thin plate splines, hmm? uh, sorry what what I wanted to say here is um, how this works for the two-dimensional smoother then we're going to typically work with something that is called a thin plate spline. So that's a specific choice for our uh, basis functions in two dimensions. 
denoted here with regression parameters gamma jn and certain types of basis functions uh, b tilde jn and typically you're going to work here with these uh, thin plate splines we'll see that in gamma and our wiggliness penalty now will rely on again on the second order derivative squared but now you will take this derivative with respect to each of the uh, dimensions uh, so both the x and the y that you are considering in your uh, two-dimensional smoother. Uh, so the, the message is here, you're going to capture, you're going to estimate these uh, smooth functions by using a clever choice of basis functions and by adding penalties. Yeah? And the type of penalty that will depend on are you doing a one-dimensional smoother, are you doing a two-dimensional smoother, are you doing this interaction effect. So there will be different choices for these penalties. But the penalties are there to avoid the uh, overfitting. And of course, there is one choice that we didn't touch upon. That's the choice of the corresponding smoothing parameter, right? So we end up with a penalized log likelihood uh, where the smoothing parameter lambda j will control the trade-off between goodness of fit and the degree of smoothness uh, and will have some built-in criteria in, um, in, in software to fit GAMS to choose these uh, smoothing parameters for us in, a, in an automatic way uh, by looking at certain criteria that you can optimize. And so typically, um, fitting procedures will look at tools like a generalized cross-validation or a Kaiki's information criterion or using something that is called REML. Hmm? Uh, as a way to, to pick suitable values for these, uh, for these lambdas. So you do not have to know what all these specific uh, tools mean, but it's a matter of trying out uh, different values of the smoothing parameters and then picking the ones that minimize the criterion that you are uh, most interested in. And as a state of the art, people um, who work on this type of, of, of statistics currently advise to go for this REML uh, fitting procedure because it turns out to be uh, more robust, robust compared to the other um, ways to choose the lambdas. So I'm going to illustrate that in R um, later on. Yeah, if you want to compare different uh, constructed gammas, uh, so say you tried different gams by including different set of variables, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you can use information criteria again. The only difference that you have to keep in mind now is that um, you cannot count the number of parameters estimated. You cannot count that explicitly because you have these penalties. Huh? So even though I'm using all of these beta j's over here to capture the smoother at j, I'm not going to count all of them as being really one parameter that I'm using because the fact that you have this penalty is going to shrink your parameter. Uh, is going to shrink, yeah, your parameters, and is thus going to reduce the effective number of parameters that is uh, used. So the message here is that AIC, BIC will be printed by um, procedures which are fitting GAMS in R or in Python or whatever, but they do something clever to get to calculate the effective. Um, degrees of freedom to calculate the number of parameters that um, we're using in this in this model okay that's what i wanted to say in terms of uh introducing the gums um so here you see a wrap-up we showed a little bit why moving away from li linearity is useful when you're building regression models we explained the highlights of, of, of different methods to go from linear to non-linear effects and we then put together the specification of a GAM. And the idea is that after the break, I'm now going to illustrate that a little bit in, uh, in R and in R Studio.